just raise our hands and just lift him up this morning. Lift him up. Let him be glorified. Let him be the focal point of everything we do. Lord, this day, this is what we do. This is what we do to lift you up, Lord God. And I just really sense the Spirit of God saying today that when we lift up the Lord, he relishes and enjoys in filling his people with the peace, with the release of any anxiety, any type of stress. You know, I just really sense, Pastor David, there's people come in this morning, and sometimes it's like the frog in the kettle. We don't really realize it, but we carry things, and we get used to it. But I hear the Spirit of God saying, no, 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 no. In my house, it's a stress-free home. In my place, there is a, a release of grace, of kindness, of mercy and joy. So get used to it. When you come into my presence, wherever you're at, throughout the week, expect me to visit you, to envelop you with my love and to be kind to you, to lift you up and to encourage you and not to be weighed down with the stress, the pressures and all that the enemy would want to bring upon you. Know this, that I paid the price for your peace. The punishment that brings you peace was laid upon me. Now, this day, says the Lord, rest, take rest and enjoy my kindness. For I will come, I lift you up, I encourage you, and I am the glory and the lifter of your head. So know this today, today, today. If everybody just breathe in right now, just really breathe in. Just raise your hands, just breathe in, and just receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. Receive of the kindness of the God. Receive the forgiveness of God. Some of you guys are just really hard on yourself. I really sense that. We're, we're really hard on ourselves, but there were this day, let there be a release, let this place be filled with your joy filled with your presence, filled with your love, Lord God. And we just give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And if somebody believes that, say amen. Give God a shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't that how the enemy works sometimes? You go ahead and have a seat. Sometimes we just get so used to living with stress, living with, because we live in Silicon Valley, etc. But you know what? That's not the norm. Kingdom people, we walk in the peace of the Lord, the love of the Lord. Amen. Amen. There is somebody I want to recognize here this morning, and I heard rumor, Pastor April, I heard it's your birthday today. Stand up. Stand up. Happy birthday. 30. Can we say that? Can we say 30? I would sing happy birthday, but then I would be ushered off the platform really quick. So God bless you this day. Amen. So I need to get something out of the way really quick. Pastor John, could you help me? So... Um, I have a question. <clears throat> no, 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 no. I, I have a question. I just got to get this out of the way. I got a har lot of harassment in the first service. But there's going to be a Super Bowl this afternoon. Now, and afterwards, there's going to be given a trophy. They call it the Lombardi Trophy. Why do they call it the Lombardi Trophy? It's not the Super Bowl. It's something about Lombardi when he coached for the Packers. So, uh, but pray for me. My heart has been in the depths of despair for the last several weeks, and uh, I don't know if I could bear watching the game this afternoon. It's uh, so, anyway, I still need, need emotional healing from the first service. I see all these red jerseys, it brings pain. So, anyway, hey, I need my team to come up here. My team, my team, my guys. I, I want to in, introduce you to a lot of the guys that are in my life group. And uh, what we want to do this morning is as these gentlemen are coming up, is kind of just backtrack a little bit here for the last several weeks. The whole subject has been prayer. How many have been blessed by that? We had Robert Henderson in, Mary Alice. We had school of prayer. Then we had the prayer surge. Come on. I believe God wants to have that surge just to continue on. We got more to share about that. Pastor David's going to tell you some good news about prayer. But I mean, and then three weeks ago, Pastor David started the whole topic of the circles of prayer. And he preached upon circling your Jericho. How many know everybody has a Jericho that you need to walk around and lift up a shout and let that thing come crashing down because God wants to do something awesome. And then Pastor Chip last week spoke about the persistency in prayer. And if you didn't see any of those, go to YouTube, get to the, go to the Gateway channel, watch those and just be encouraged. Now, my assignment today is to talk about prayer, but also today is Life Group Sunday. And so we are starting a brand new season uh, our life groups in the next 12 weeks, all the way going up to Resurrection Sunday, where we want to encourage and promote people to get into small groups. Do we have enough chairs? Come on, Gabe. You should take that jersey off. <laughs> 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 
I'm going to introduce these guys to you here soon, except for Gabe. So, <laughs> but we're going to be talking about small groups, and we encourage everybody to get into small groups. We call them life groups here. And so we wanted to emphasize that you can get signed up and get into a group, but we're going to dovetail the topic of prayer in a small group. And that is going to be very, very important for this for us to look at that, because what we're talking about this morning here, if you can put the next slide is up or you see it already, discovering the power of small group prayer. So not only do we gather together in large gatherings, but my friends, I am going to share with you, and my goal is to inspire you to be a part of a small group somewhere, somehow, because there is tremendous power when people gather together. Let's look at Matthew 18 and kind of lay the foundation for this morning here, because Jesus tells us and gives us some insight into the power of just what a couple of people can do. Matthew 18, verses 18 and 20. Now I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. It's a beautiful translation, and if you don't have it, you can go find it on version. It's great. Uh, Jesus said here, receive this truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be considered to be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will be considered to be released in heaven. How many know that we need to do some releasing, right? And we have that authority by our king to do that. Amen? Again, I give you an eternal truth. If two of you agree to ask God for something in a symphony of prayer, my heavenly Father will do it for you. For whoever, for wherever, two or three come together in honor of my name, I am right there with them. You see, our king, our Lord, he's looking for two, two or three people. Two or three people. I mean, this is one of the most astounding verses in the Bible. I mean, let's just take off all limitations. Let's take off all doubt here and let's listen to what Jesus said. He says, okay, I'm looking for two or three of you guys, okay? And listen, when you get together, whenever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it for you. I mean, Tom, isn't that mind-boggling to think of the potential of what you can do in your family, in your workplace, in the health of your body, whatever you need here. And these gentlemen up here, these guys are a part of my small group. And uh, there's Daniel and John, Kenny, Mike, John. Uh, what was your name again, sir? Ricky. <laughs> little Ricky. And then Gabe here. We're going to talk a little bit this morning about the power of what this verse can contain and what we have experienced. And we want to share this with you because Jesus says, all I need is two or three here. And it's the, and the impossible can take place. You stop and think about uh, Azusa Street 100 years ago plus. It was just a group of small, a small group of people that prayed and believed God and the Holy Spirit was poured out. You look at the Welch Revival. It was just a small group of people and it changed the world. You see, come, imagine if we grabbed or grabbed our hold of this verse here, what we can do in San Jose if we believed it, we got together and we prayed it. It, it just takes two or three believers to change the world. If we believe that, if we believe that. And so what I want to show you here this morning is that we are here today because of a prayer in a small group. We are here today because of prayer, literally, that occurred in a small group. You can put that next slide up. I want to show you a picture of the Gangite River. This river is right outside the town of Philippi. And several thousand years ago, there was a prayer meeting of just a few people gathering here on this little bank here. We don't know for sure where it was at. Nobody knows. But this is the Gangai River. And a couple of people got together, and literally, you have a seat here in this house today because of that prayer meeting. And I'm going to show you that. In fact, the, the record goes in Acts chapter 16. If you look at that on your notes and look at the screen here, I'm going to walk you through what happened and what transpired that led to such a massive release of God's anointing that changed the world. You see, in Acts chapter 16, what took place was that there was a prayer meeting with Lydia and other ladies at the river of this Gangai area here. And what happened was that Paul and Silas gathered together with Lydia, and Pastor Carol Cohen made it a point to tell me between services that it was a woman. God used a woman to change the world. You're sitting here today because of a woman's prayer meeting. Is that right? In fact, Pastor Carol, come up here, man. Tell, tell, you, got a, you got some more prayer meetings coming up here. Wait, how'd you like that segue? That was good. That was good. <laughs> smooth, smooth. 
yeah, we're, we're, we're believing on that whatever prayer. Yeah, yeah. So we got something happening um, starting February the 12th. Uh, we're going to start our table talks again. And so women are going to be coming. It's uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And we're going to meet in the cafe. And we're going to have a whole lineup of very gifted, talented, anointed women who are going to be sharing with you. And then th we're going to break up into tables and we're going to be talking about it and praying for each other and creating those small groups. In fact, if you're either a small group leader, at a table talk leader, or one of the speakers, would you stand? Most of them, I think, were in the first service. But, <laughs> but yeah, there you go. In fact, would all the life group leaders, if you're a life group leader in, in the men's group or, or mixed or anything, any life group leaders, would you stand? Look at this. All right, let's give them a hand. In fact, if you want to be with the strong people who's really making things happen in those whatever prayers, join a live group. And if you can't find one to get into right now, come to the, to the table talks. It'll be a real easy segue. You'll be sitting there with other people. Then you'll sit with four or five, and it'll just be a real smooth transition. And you could then, if you so wanted to, take that live group out of the table and take it into your home and start your group that way. Real easy. <laughs> Carol Cohen is a powerful lady. Anyway, so Paul is in Greece. He's praying with Lydia at the river here. The Lord opens up her home, or Lydia opens up her home to Paul and Silas. A small group is started in this lady's home. And what happens is, is that because of the prayer, because of the anointing, because of the Holy Spirit, Paul's influence and the influence of the gospel permeates this small town. Historians tell us it was between 10 to 15,000 in population. And because of that prayer meeting, other people began to come to Christ. Other people began to gather, etc., to such an extent that it disrupted the economy of the city. There was pagan worship in that place, and there was people getting saved out of paganism and coming to Paul's group there at Lydia's home, and the authorities got all upset about it. And uh, on your notes there, it says, Paul and Silas, they were thrown in jail. And then all of a sudden, we know the story if you've read it, the jail, uh, people were praying in the jail, the jail was shaken, and the jailer and his guard and the guard and his family, they received Christ. So what I'm talking about is how just a few people met for a prayer meeting. Next thing you know, there was tremendous results. In fact, let's do a quick review of what took place, the results of this prayer. Number one, the Lord opened hearts to the gospel. How many know you got people that you know you know, crazy Uncle Harry or your demonized boss or your kids or whatever, that the Lord needs to open their hearts. Amen? See, the Bible says in 1 John that if you see a person who's not right with God, we can pray and the Lord will give them life. Remember we, earlier we read how that whatever we release, we can pray that and how we can pray that over people that don't know Christ. And there's a battle that goes and takes place over their soul. And there's a heavenly warfare that takes place. And we can release the anointing over their lives to see the power of God open up a person's heart. How many here this morning know people that need to have their heart open to the Lord? Amen. And so how many know that our prayer can make a difference? Remember Jesus said, I just need two or three of you to begin asking stuff that's almost impossible. It's just like Pastor David shared a couple of weeks ago how we need to have bold prayers. I mean, can you believe that people come to the Lord, hearts are opened up. I mean, yesterday we had our prayer meeting here and we prayed for the chairman of Apple Computer. How many know that God is going to open up his heart? He was raised a Southern Baptist. I don't know if you know that. And God can turn that heart around just like that. How many can agree with that? Amen? And we can have great influence. We can go to Google. We can go to Facebook. We can walk into these places in prayer and believe God to open up hearts. I believe God wants to use us in the area. I, got, I believe God wants to accelerate. That's what happened with the Welsh Revival, Azusa Street. God opened people's hearts. And we can do that in Jesus' name. But look at this. Number two, disciples were made. Now, did you know, back in those days, a couple thousand years ago, they had no internet. They didn't have any mobile phones. They didn't have television. They didn't have DVDs or CDs or, or whatever. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have texting. They didn't have any of that. What they had was prayer. What they had was prayer and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen carefully. Listen carefully this morning because you see, discipleship is fueled by prayer. Growing in Christ is fueled by prayer. A car doesn't go anywhere unless it's got gas. 
Prayer is the gas behind your car. You, jet fuel is what gets an airplane off the ground. If you want to see your life change, prayer. Come to prayer. Come to prayer meetings. Get together with people in prayer. And you can have all the technology you want, and it's just head knowledge. But prayer takes it down deep into the heart and begins to change things, challenges demonic hosts, and brings about heaven on earth. Remember, Jesus said, whatever you release is released. Whatever you forbid is what you, whatever is forbidden. Excuse me. And so I'm getting excited because I know this works. We've seen it work many times. And so prayer opens the heart. Prayer is what causes growth in discipleship. Number three, deliverance was experienced. Now, if you've read Acts chapter 16 and you've heard the story, Paul and Silas were beaten because of their faith in Christ and thrown into jail. Their feet were in stocks. And it says it was at the midnight hour they did something. Grant, the midnight hour. Anybody ever have a midnight hour? What is the midnight hour? When things are dark. Paul didn't know how long he was going to be in prison. Paul didn't know what circumstances were going to take place. Things were dark. My wife and I have been in some dark days. No job, no money, raising kids. Dark days. How many people have had dark situations? Gabe, I know you've had some dark days. Ricky, you just came through some dark days. It was the midnight hour. You guys should hear this man's story of what God did for his family. John, we know some of the dark days you've been through, but we stood with you in those dark days. Mike, this guy could write a book. If you knew this guy's testimony, he could write a book. Holy Ghost Mike, this is who he is. But I mean, and then Kenny and John, and then Daniel, each one of you guys, right? We all know what it means to have dark days where you don't see the answer, where you're waiting on God. Sometimes you lose your faith. Sometimes you're challenged. You don't know what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. How many have been in a dark day in your life? But you see, those pagan guys that put Paul in jail, they made a grave mistake. They put Paul and Silas in there together. Hey, hey well, well, back up. Rewind the tape. It says wherever two or three are gathered, okay? It would have been better, Bethany, for them to put them in separate cells, right? But no, 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 no. What a setup. I mean, this is a Holy Ghost setup where God said, okay, guys, we're going to demonstrate to the world what it means that when it just takes two. I just need Gabe and Ricky. Come on. You guys get together. And you, I don't care how dark it is. Carrie Stewart, you've been through some dark days. But this is why we need one another. This is why we need to have prayer together. And I could see Paul leaning over to Silas. Silas looking over at Paul. And all of a sudden, you see what happened was they didn't know that Paul, he's the guy that said, if God's for me, who can be against me, right? He's the guy that said, he always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus, amen? Paul's the guy that said, who's gonna separate me from the love of God? They didn't know what they were dealing with. They didn't know that Paul was the guy that remembered Micah, where Micah says, rejoice not against me, my enemy. When I fall, I will rise, and when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light around me. Silas, give me your hand. Come here, Daniel, John, come here. Come here, whatever you guys, come here. Give me your hand. This is Silas, here's Paul. Their feet are in stocks, but I tell you what, their faith is not bound. Come on, you could put them in the darkest situation, but as long as there's the spark of faith, and brother, I'm gonna encourage you, you're gonna encourage me. We grab our hands together, and then we remember that, hey, remember Jesus said, if we pray, we'll do something, right? Amen. And I'm telling you, I'm looking at John here. John's been through some dark days. Remember that time I texted you? I was in Zion Park on vacation. I was waking about 2.30 in the morning, and I sensed something's going on with John. I fire a text off to you, and I don't remember all the details, but you fired back 2.30 in the morning. You see, this is what we do. This is what we, we have one another's back. We have each other's life. We, we pray for one another. That's why I'm so proud of these men up here. I can call any one of these guys at any time, and we start a ch text chain, and we're communicating, we're praying, we're breaking strongholds. And see, we don't have a dark night. Things may be dark in the natural, but we know that if we stand together, things can change, change radically here. And what happened was is that Paul and Silas began to pray. The jail was shaken. We know the story. The jailer tried to commit himself and kill himself, and that the whole family, the whole jailer's family received Christ. But watch what happened. We had a prayer meeting at a riverside. House opened up to the Lord. People were becoming Christians. It began to proliferate throughout all of Philippi. The jailer receives Christ, and a church is birthed right there in Philippians. 
And because of that, the gospel moved all the way through Europe, all the way to the United States. And again, you and I are sitting here in a situation that was looked like it was midnight, Judy. Looked like it was over, but how many know with God it's never over? Amen? How many can say, praise God, it is never over? He calls the, the beginning and the end. That's why you and I, we need one another. You think we do life groups and small groups just because it's a, another church program? Or it's because this is what other churches do or it's cool? You can call them life groups, small groups. It doesn't matter. What we're talking about is the body of Christ getting together. And I, I read somewhere where it says if one will put 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight. We can get together anywhere and still get together so that we can pray, support, and love, and minister to one another. And we'll get together at Starbucks. We'll go to sit in the parking lot, whatever. And we'll say, hey, Ricky, how you doing? Or Gabe, how you doing? And then we will be able to continue to pray, hold each other up, and believe God for his grace. Amen? Somebody praise God this morning for what he does. Okay, quickly here. I'm going to look at five different types of small group prayer. Five different types of small group prayer. So I'm going to transition from preaching to teaching. So you got your notes. Uh, I'm not going to go spend a lot of time going over a lot of, a lot of the details. Uh, you can do that later, Han. But what our goal is, is just to lay some foundation of some things to do and don't when you get together with one another, husband and wife, family, small group, life group, etc. So we talk about drawing near prayers, life application prayers, personal prayers, prayer for those without Christ, and Thanksgiving prayer. These are principles. Sometimes we get together, we'll do all five. Sometimes we'll just do one. There's no rules. But we do start with number one, which is drawing near prayer. How many know you need to start with the presence of Christ? How many know you need to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit? How many know that, I mean, Daniel, you could be going through and you've had, you might have just a hard week just getting beat up by all kinds of circumstances. And Dan, John, you might, you know, something may have fallen apart and you need to kind of, you know, have a heart check. Same thing, Kenny, all of us here. The first thing that we do, some of us need to maybe ask for forgiveness, need to have some cleansing or whatever. But how many know in the presence of God, things begin to change? That's why we invite the Holy Spirit. And so in the, the draw near prayer, it begins with worship, thanksgiving, and praise, invites the presence of the Lord, personal cleansing and forgiveness, releases anxiety and worry, receives God's peace and joy. This could be a 30-second prayer or a 30-minute prayer. It all depends on what the Lord wants to do, the Spirit of God wants to do, because we can get together. There's been times we get together, we just worship God. Or we just say a quick prayer, Maybe Gabe, Gabe says the quick prayer, come Holy Spirit, and then we get launched right into the study of whatever we're going over that night. But how many know drawing near is imperative? That's the first thing. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Return to me and I will return to you. We need that draw near prayer. The next one, life application prayer. This prayer here is where we will take, say, Pastor David will teach on a Sunday morning, we take his notes, and then we go home, and it's just like it says in Acts chapter 2, the disciples continued in the apostles' teaching. What that means is we take the notes, like what we have here this morning, and we go home and we make it real. We apply it. We'll go over it. As an example, Pastor David a couple of weeks ago talked about the importance of, of prayer and obedience, how we need to obey the Lord. And so we will get together, and we'll talk about that, and that'll be part of our study. And with some of us here, we need a heart check. With some of us here, everything's good. And we begin to make it real. It's life application. It's not just academic. It's where we get the rubber meets the road, and we say, hey, guys, it, how does this apply? So look at your notes there. It's a time to apply the group lesson. It asks, how does this truth apply to me? What do I need to change what should I be doing? We're talking about life application. God forbid we should hear a word on a Sunday morning and then go home, and by the time we get home, we forget what was spoken. Remember Jesus said when the seed is like the seed sown in the word, the word of God is like seed that's sown in ground. When the enemy comes, he wants to take it away. And you see, there's a spiritual warfare that occurs. When you hear what God says, when you hear, hear the scriptures, we go home, and then in a life group, small group, we open up and we say, okay, Lord, make this real. We want to apply it in our lives. It's based on God's word to change a life. It's focused, it's faith-filled, transformational. It's the basis to pray for each other. So 
you know, here's my, my team. The other half was here in the first service, and most of them had 49 regalia on. So, Gabe, you're the only one. We forgive you this morning. Look at these guys, all Packer fans. <laughs> I prophesy that in Jesus' name. <laughs> But we will go over, you know, John might need prayer, uh, you know, Mike might need some area, and then we, we not only have that time during the group, but also in between group meetings. We stay connected, and we pray through whatever we studied in the life application. And then there's personal prayer, a time to share personal needs with the group, targeted to specific desired results. And many times we write down group needs, pray for each other throughout the week, share testimonies of answered prayer. And so we've got a thing where we have a, a group text and that thing gets fired up on a Monday night or a Tuesday morning, whatever. And if there's a need, all these guys are on group text and the guys were in their first service. And you should see some of the emails. I'm concerned about Ricky though. You gotta, he's got some emojis here that are just crazy. But, uh, uh, but it's one of those things where we're ongoing having personal prayer and we're having an ongoing dialogue here. And I know this, like I've said earlier, I can text these guys at any time, anywhere, and I know I got prayer. Same thing with them. That's what you need as well, everybody in this building. The next one, prayer for those without Christ. Here's these principles. We identify three people who don't know Christ. We intercede for those, we invite them, and we believe the Lord to open their hearts. So everybody in this house here this morning, we know people who don't know Christ. And one of the vital components of our life group ministry is being able to outreach to people who don't know Jesus Christ. See, guys, it's just not about us. It's about them. There's thousands of people out there that want to know about Jesus Christ, and they're waiting on us. And so what we do is, me and the guys here, we write down people's names, and we add that to our group. And it, it doesn't take long. You know, we write down their names, and it could take maybe a minute or two minutes. It's not long and drawn out. But what it does is it keeps the, the, the presence of outreach in front of us all the time. See, that's the heartbeat of Jesus. He said, go make disciples. He said, this world belongs to me. I want to see people come to the Lord. How many know that the, he said the harvest is ripe, ready to be brought in? And so we have prayer for the lost. And we many times will look for ways to invite them. And we'll come to Sunday morning service. We'll go do a men's barbecue or whatever. And so even though this, even today, be thinking about who you know that needs to come to Christ. Pray for their heart to be opened up and look for a way to invite them to church. Amen? Okay, and then the last type of prayer is Thanksgiving prayer, where after everything's said and done, it's just praise to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the time we can be in the Word. Thank you for answers to prayer, etc. And we can go down every one of these men here. And like I said, I'm so proud of these guys because I know what they've been through. We're connected, we're praying, and we're seeing life transformation. When I first met these guys, none of them were leaders. All of these guys today are leading small groups, discipling other men, reaching out, and we're doing it again and again and again. That's what we do. This is the part of the gospel that I love because we see God transform lives. Amen? Hey, look at your notes. Small group prayer guidelines. Don't do this. Let me go over that first before I share with you what you're supposed to do. It's not a deliverance prophetic conference. Between services, Jesse Gale comes up, and he said he had a guy one time come up to him, and he asked him what he needed for prayer. And this guy says, uh, for my hearing. And Jesse grabbed him by his throat, and he grabbed him by his ears. You come out in Jesus' name. He's just, you know, praying really, really hard, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy says, no, 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 it's, it's my court hearing, not, not my ear hearing. And you see, it's not a... It's not a Slow down, slow down, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we get together, it's for edification, for, for ministry to whatever, but I mean, we start, there's some groups, well, that's all they do is they prophesy over every, all the time. And you got Joe comes in from next door who's brand new, he's thinking, oh, what are you guys doing? You know, this is, this is, or, or deliverance, the same thing. I got some wild stories of what people have tried to do in small groups. Don't do it. If you got somebody that needs help, here's Pastor John. His home phone number is in the bulletin, and you can call him. He can take care of it for you. Also, number two, don't pray around the world. Now, we've had to correct Ricky Nunez on this a couple times. Stand up here, bro. Come here, come here, come here. You want to meet a zealous brother? 
Everybody get up, give it up for Ricky Nunez. <laughs> I do, no, 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 I'm not gonna give you the mic. He will take it. But Ricky will pray around the world. I mean pray around the world. No, 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 we're, we're just praying for, you know, for Larry in his sandwich. You know, not around the world. <laughs> if you need anybody to pray around the world, he'll go to Africa and Zimbabwe, he'll go to Korea, he'll be everywhere, right? He's a prayer warrior, but back up a little bit. <laughs> you're, you're done. Yeah, you can sit down now. <laughs> Number three, allow somebody to take over the meeting. I was in a group one time. Young man stands up. Yay, thus saith the Lord. The Lord would say, yay, the Lord would say, that I am to marry Sally. And then the guy sitting next to her, an older guy, stands up. Yay, thus saith the Lord, you shall not marry my daughter Sally. <laughs> the guy to take over the meeting. You know, they, you, you, you don't do that. You got it? <laughs> and then number four, allow a spiritual panic attack. Anybody ever seen that? I mean, I have seen the raw power of God hit people's lives and get out of the way. It's just like, you know, in the New Testament, man, they thought they were drunk in Acts chapter 2. But not every week, you know, not, not every time you get together because it's, you got brand new people coming in and they'll think you need medicine. I mean, it's just not, not cool. Or number five, don't force prayer. Don't pressure people to pray. So uh, Eddie Rogers used to take me to Bible studies when I was in college. That's Aaron Rogers' dad, by the way. Packer, just had to throw that in. So anyway, Eddie, Eddie, literally, Eddie Rogers used to take me to Bible studies, and I was a good Catholic. I had no idea how to pray, unless it's the Hail Mary or Our Father or whatever. And so we're in a circle, and it, so picture this, all of us being in a circle, and they come around to me, and I had no idea how to pray. It was one of those Southwest, want to get away, and it, I felt so foolish. I did not know how, because I wasn't saved yet. So if you're in a group, don't pray in a circle. Don't force people. You know, just say, hey, hey, do you need, would you, would you like prayer? Or you want to lead in prayer? Anybody that would like to keep a, you know, say a prayer, whatever. So you keep it safe with people. Go to the next slide there. Do, this is what we want to do. Number one is use conversational prayer. Keep it simple. In fact, I, I share this a lot with guys, with men. Pray with your wives. There's a lot of men that don't know how or don't have the courage to pray with your wife. And all you need to do is make it simple Keep it safe and just share your heart and pray to the Lord. It could be a 30-second prayer. My wife and I pray every morning. And sometimes she'll pray, I pray, whatever. But it's short. But yet at the same time, it's just conversation. It is not a high English, thee and thou, etc. It's a very simple prayer. Number two, short, simple, and to the point prayers. Number three, keep your prayers safe and faith-filled. Number four, based on God's word and promises. And number five, take turns as others feel open. And so here's the bottom line, is you want the life of Christ, his Holy Spirit, anointing in that group, right? And it could be two or three, four, whatever. It could be a bunch of guys like this here. We get together. And the bottom line is this, is that we have different ways of praying in small groups. But somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know what? As we do this here, we're going to see changes. We're going to see people healed. We're going to see people delivered. And every one of these guys up here, like I said, I know their story, and I know what struggles they've been through, and I know what, what God has done in their life because we get together in a small group, and we pray in that small group here. I hear the Lord encouraging you guys here to be in a group somewhere, somehow. Don't be isolated all by yourself. Find somebody to get with and be a part of a group so that you can be a uh, part of a prayer team. Now, if you're already in a group, get the notes, share it with your group, and continue to build that whole prayer atmosphere. And what will happen is, is that, as we saw in Philippi, I believe we can make a difference here in San Jose, Santa Rosa, Modesto, Clovis, wherever we've got a gateway campus. Our heartbeat is prayer, corporately and in small groups. Amen? I'm finished. One more slide. Here's our assignments, our assignment. Everybody here today, before the Super Bowl, find two or three other believers in Christ and begin to pray. We're going to have prayer later on today as well, this morning. But, I mean, make it a part of your life. If you're not in a small group, get a part of, be a part of a small group to begin having a life of prayer. And then to join or start a life group, go to mygatewaycity.churchlifegroups and get connected. Get connected and believe God for his grace. Amen? But you know what, though? I want to back up a little bit. We were talking about uh, the midnight hour. 
And I really sense this morning, Pastor David, that there are people in this house today that came through the doors, but yet you're in a midnight hour with your family, your health, husband walk out on a wife or whatever. How many can say, hey, pray for me? Raise your hand. I need prayer. I'm in one of those midnight hours. There's hands everywhere here this morning going up. Anyone else? Let's just pray right now. Father, in Jesus, if you, in fact, keep your hands up. And if you're close by those people that have their hand raised, here's a great opportunity where we can pray for one another. In fact, guys, let's all stand up here, my team here, and let's, let's begin just praying. Let's stretch our hands out. Lord, you said whatever we release, you have already released in heaven. So we release your anointing, your grace for every person that raised their hands and those that didn't raise their hand that are in the midnight hour. Lord, we need to see a demonstration of your grace, your power, and Lord, of your love to be able to see, Lord, deliverances and to see provision, to see breakthrough. So we speak that in the name of Jesus Christ, that Lord, this day, Lord, people are going to be leaving, Lord, with breakthrough in their life. And we just know, in fact, I hear the, the word of the Lord saying that, yes, I shook a jail, but don't be discouraged because I still shake the heavens. I still shake that above you in the spiritual realm. You begin to pray and I begin to act. Don't be discouraged and don't be looking around to expect and, and to see much in the natural because I'm already working in the supernatural. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord God. You're already shifting things, changing things. You're setting up people for breakthrough this day. And we give you praise for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. But there's one other decision here. Guys, you can have a seat. Thank you. But there's one other decision here. Every head bowed, every eye closed, because there are people here today that have never met Jesus Christ. They don't know the Lord. And we want to pray right now the Lord opens your heart. The Lord opens your heart to his love, his salvation, who he is, and what he wants to provide. So right now, if anybody here, raise your hand. If you say, yes, today I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to come to know him. I want to live for him. I want to turn my life over to him. And I just thank you, Lord God, this day for coming into my life. In fact, let's all just pray this together. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. I ask you to come into my life. Fill my heart with your love, your forgiveness. I turn everything I am over to you. And I ask you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life. Fill me with your spirit and begin to open up doors for me to know you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you prayed that for the very first time or if you're a guest today, you want to get into a life group, there's a card in front of you in the seat pocket. Fill that out and drop that in the offering bucket as it comes by or go see Daniel here at the connection counter afterwards out in the lobby here. We'd love to connect with you give you some more information about what it means to walk with Jesus Christ and uh, help you take that next step in your journey as a believer in Christ. Amen. Ushers, come on up forward here. We're going to receive the tithe and offering. So, Lord, we just thank you for this time as we give to you. Lord, we thank you that you're a faithful God to bless and, Lord, to be able to provide all of our needs as we put you first in Jesus' name. Amen.
we bless you, Lord. Thank you for the gathering today, Lord. Unto you shall the gathering of the people be. Jesus, we thank you that you have invoked life upon us. You have imparted Holy Spirit power into us today. And your word has guided us. Lord, let the blessing of heaven go with each person. Everyone watching online, everyone in six locations this morning, would you bless this house and bless our city and lead us forward in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, listen, before I turn you loose, I want to let you know there's a water baptismal service in the cafe. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, that's a, that's, a, that's a tremendous blessing. Oh, next week. Oh, John told me it was today. Oh, well, then why are you telling me about it today? <laughs> oh, okay, you're invited to a water baptismal service. If you need to be baptized, now I get it. Old age is a real thing, people. It's, it, it's a real thing. Don't, don't ever underestimate it. Finally, this Friday is the first Friday. Now, we're going to have 12 first Friday rip-snorting, fire-breathing prayer meetings in 2020. And the first one is this Friday night, so 7.30. And we, we invite you, bring your friends. We're going to be, our theme for this Friday night is outpouring. We are going to pray for Holy Spirit outpouring in San Jose and around the world. So if you want to be a part of that kind of an experience, join us at 7.30 this Friday night. And uh, Pastor Chris, I want to thank you for your leadership. And that message today was awesome, tremendous. What a great man. We praise God for that. And uh, finally, uh, the greatest outreach of the year is just uh, six or ten weeks away, and that is Resurrection Sunday. And that we will have a Good Friday service. We will have three Sunday morning services in all of our cities. It's going to be a massive. We see more people come to Christ in Resurrection Weekend than at any other Sunday in the year. And I need your help. I'm calling for resources. I'm calling for the helpers. I need choir members. I need ushers. I need greeters. I need parking lot people. I need tech people. I need actors. There's going to be an information meeting, an interest meeting next Sunday after this service in the NPR. So I'm, I'm asking you, if you don't know necessarily, you haven't made the commitment or whatever, but you want to be a part of a tremendous evangelistic outreach weekend next week after this service, there's going to be an interest, interest meeting, okay? Please help us. It's going to be a tremendous uh, service. All right. I love each and every one of you. Go Niners. Here we go. And uh, even if you're rooting for somebody else, turn around and greet each other. God bless you. And if you need prayer, our team is here. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for being a part. We'll see you Friday night for First Fire.